Got it. We just got a thousand subscribers, so thank you to each and every one of you who watches my videos. Uh, it's very heartwarming. So thank you again. Uh, and ever uh, you guys can message me anytime, whatever you need, I'm happy to help. And this one came from one of these messages. A guy named uh, Doug Tableman, fencing out of Virginia, uh, asked if I wanted to be interviewed. So I said yes. So. Uh, just hear my thoughts on my life with fencing. It was definitely full of up and downs. So if you're if you're struggling uh, with fencing or even life in general, uh, and fencing is an outlet, uh, just keep going. Don't stop. Uh, because for me, to some extent, fencing borderline saved my life. So uh, without further ado, here we go. All right, Sam. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Um, my name is Doug Tableman. I'm a fencing coach in Virginia and a new fan of your channel. I really like the content you've been putting out, and I was hoping to learn a little bit more about you and maybe help share that information with your other viewers. Yeah, uh, I guess thanks for watching. Uh, it's still a, it's a bit of my, my little pet project uh, as a kind of a, a way to... I, in one sense, it's when I learn something, I put it in the video just so i like if, I, if sometimes you get epiphanies so every time i learn something new i just make a video on it uh, nice that I way you can go back and search it up. yeah exactly and you kind of see my progression like i can kind of see my own progression through tactics as i watch my videos just as how they progress it's nice to be able to go back and review so uh starting at the beginning let's get your details can i get your age uh what club you fence for and what your goals are in competition uh, I'm 34. I fence at Dynamo in Vancouver. Uh, my goal, I mean, obviously, like if if everything goes well, I'd like to go to Paris 2024. Yeah, uh, that's a very ambitious goal. Uh, but beyond that, uh, my my short term goal was to make 64s at least once in a World Cup this year, which I did. Uh, so now it's I think I actually I think I can make 16. So next goal, 16s ultimate goal it would be to go to the Olympics. That's fantastic. Um, how long have you been fencing at Dynamo? Dynamo? Uh, I moved here about three years ago. So basically, I moved here and COVID started. Okay. Uh, um, just awful. Rough um, timing. Um, I was curious because up until COVID, I used to go to Dynamo every summer for the summer camp. Um, I really like the club and the people there. Yeah, it's a great club. I moved there because there's a guy named Eric Boas. Uh, yeah, you may or may not have heard of him, but anyway, he's, he's a pretty good fencer. Um, back when I was, because I took a really, so my timeline's a little bit weird, but I, I took a very, very long break from fencing, uh, and then I came back into it, and with my now fiance, at one point I was uh, Igor from Dynamo, uh, while I was still fencing in Toronto, he was like, "Hey, do you want to come to Dynamo?" I was like, uh, "I mean, if my job will move me, why not?" <laughs> Uh, so That's I awesome. ask, and then uh, I, I'd been dating my fiance for barely like eight months or something. So for me to ask her to be like, "You want to pick up and go to Vancouver?" and she was like, "Absolutely, we're out." So uh, my job, I'm a financial advisor, mm -hmm. uh, but they have a, my my firm specifically has a, an office in Vancouver, so they're really happy to have a French guy like willingly go to Vancouver. So <laughs> they they actually they paid for my flight. So I was like, "All right, well, this is getting." easier by the minute that's fantastic that's awesome that everything came together like that and then yeah as soon as i moved here covid started so i was like great i put myself in the best position to go get a bunch of experience and now i can't use it yeah how long were you shut down for officially like a solid six months of nothing mm. uh unofficially three months of nothing with secret practices <laughs> But uh, yeah. it was still only like maybe once a week or whatever, because it got busted. It was just awful. Yeah, and losing all that momentum is tough, even if you can like get back to it a little bit. Well, yeah, and then there's competing. Like the, the adrenaline of competing, what you learn out of it is different from even just losing at the club or even internal competitions at the club. It's not quite the same. There's still a bit of stress, but you're losing to your friends constantly or beating your friends constantly. So it's not the same stress. It's not someone you don't know. Like it's, it's very hard to see where some of your skills that you've been working on can come up just because everyone knows what you're going to do. And it's just a weird way to practice. But I mean, 
I was fortunate to be at a strong club because if I was honestly like not, not to bash Toronto fencing, but if I was in Toronto still, I would have likely just called it, called it a day and then just started coaching as much as I could and only making YouTube videos or something. Gotcha. Okay. So how did you get started with fencing? How old were you? I was 15 or 16, uh, like last year cadet. Uh, I'm actually, I remember um, after a year, I was still allowed to do cadet, but uh, I wasn't actually supposed to. Uh, they accidentally mm -hmm. registered me, but just because uh, the timings of my birthday. So I came dead last, but they were like, by the way, your dead last ranking doesn't count. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> cool. Great. Like, just go tell that to the kid who just got his ass handed to him. Um, <laughs> So that, uh, yeah, 15 or 16 ish, uh, I was, what did I do in high school? Like I was getting really into trumpet actually. So if I had not started fencing, I'd probably, be, probably be really into music, uh, just cause I have a, a bit of an, a, like addictive personality when I get into something, like I just can't stop. So as soon as I started fencing, my dad was like, great, here's some money, go. Uh, you're, you're doing a sport on your own without me forcing you to, this is fantastic. Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm a huge nerd. So like, I would just like, I was playing Counter-Strike probably like, God knows, like six hours a day it was disgusting. <laughs> um, so okay, thank God, because I, I would not be a healthy human being right now, I think, if I didn't start fencing. That origin story is uh, very familiar. I tell my students that my sport before fencing was speech and debate. Which... Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. And then what I liked about fencing, I actually like, I lost a lot. I was not good. I was yeah. one of the worst beginners. But um, I felt like to some extent you could outsmart people. Uh, and on that, I was, I, I got kind of hooked. I was like, this is hard, but I can do it. There's something really satisfying about outsmarting somebody like with your body. Like you're having to move through it and do everything at the right time. Yeah, I was like this pudgy little boy. So every time I was like winning, I was like, haha. -ha. <laughs> how would you like, how did you manage to lose to me? Like, <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, that is uh, that is very familiar. Um, what do you feel like your breakthrough moment was? Where before you, you held a sword and after that, like, oh, I'm a fencer. Uh, my first, I would say false breakthrough, though, but I won a medal at a regional event and I thought I was so good. Like, nice. Oh, man, like, I'm a C-rated fencer. Get out of here, everyone. And like, meanwhile, I was just going to the back of the strip and just extending my arm and people just run into it. It was great. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then I actually, like, I started French grip by accident. Uh, oh. I would have, I was attracted to the pistol grip because it looked cooler, but it was the last one in the box. I, I got, I, I would get to practice pretty late because of school. Uh, so I always had the last pick and it was only a French handle. So I just happened to fence French grip. That is uh, such a cool story. <laughs> So yeah, just because I was late, it was French grip. Because otherwise, I would one hundred percent been drawn to pistol grip, uh, just because it looked you, cooler. Fair, but you uh, you liked it and you started holding it at the end and helped. Yeah, with I just sticking started. I think I and then I back then YouTube wasn't huge, but like you saw some fencers and like Genet was huge back then. So I saw yeah. that and I was like, I like that. <laughs> but, and he was very different, which I liked. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that of just like, oh, French grip fencing. What? How do I do this? Oh, Genet. Okay, that looks cool. Let me try that. that oh, it's way harder than it looks. Hard. <laughs> yeah, and then um, yeah, I did a regional. I thought it was very good, so I was like, I'm going to do nationals. So I went to nationals and came dead last in every single event. And then I was like, I still think I can do this. <laughs> so then I I just kept doing it. I was but like I started in like my I officially really started my first year of junior. And it's a it's a bloodbath. Uh, it wasn't oh, yeah. even that bad back then. Uh, now it's even worse. Like these kids are good. Uh, if I started at that point, there's no, I don't. It's different. Like back then, Japanese wasn't even like considered a strong country, right? Like now, if you have a yeah. Japanese, you're like, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> like that guy might just win the World Cup today. <laughs> yeah, my experience is more domestic, but like sending my kids into juniors, if you start when you're fifteen and you're seventeen competing, the kid across from you has been doing this for seven years. Yeah, and exactly. Bridging that gap is so tough. Well, I well, it was one of the first things when I came to Vancouver, you probably know the kid Nick Zhang. Mm. Uh, he won like two cadets uh, next last year, I think. anyway, but he he was 
murdering me at practice when I first got to Dynamo. Like I'm talking like 15-5 and I was infuriated that this 15 year old was like just destroying me. That That's is a, a big yeah. wake up call. But going from getting destroyed by a 15 year old to going 15-14 with Seclosi in three years? How did that happen? Uh, a, a lot of humility. <laughs> I had to, ex so what big thing was, uh, so let's, how do we break it down? Uh, so it started off as I showed up and I would like, you know, there's a guy like Dylan French was there too. He's very good. Uh, these mm -hmm. guys are all blade heavy and I'm a French grip. I'm, I, but like it, on a technical level, I knew I could do everything, but on a mental aspect, I was an absolute just shit show. Uh, you start losing and then like just that trail of thought where you're like, I suck at fencing. I, at one point, like, I even, like, started, I kept saying I suck at fencing, and I was just, like, it, I was reinforcing that I thought I sucked. Uh, so I just stopped saying it entirely. That's smart. That's a really easy spiral to get into. So what started off was I started focusing on, like, three or four skills, uh, like, three or four actions, and I try not to deviate. Uh, mm. And my approach to bouts, uh, like, you got, like... I'll, I'll accept that I'm getting pushed and I'll work with that for a day. Just you let people push you or today you're like, I'm fencing on that side of the strip and that's it. And you got to figure a way out that way. When you get to world cups and you're fencing on knowns, you're like, wow, this guy likes to push. I've practiced this. Wow. This guy likes to back up. I've practiced this. And then never, ever get caught sleeping in the middle. Like don't play rock, paper, scissors. If something's yeah. happening in the middle of the strip and you get hit, it's your own fault every time. And actually against the closey, I think the three times he tries something on the on the ready go within the first five seconds, I I get him. Yeah, you mentioned that you knew he liked to do that and that you were always ready for it, which is great going into that bout. Yeah, exactly. So as long as you're ready on that ready go, you can't get punished. And like that, uh, I call it like that tourist effect, right? Where you're just not ready. You're just kind of cruising along and all of a sudden you get hit and you're like, great. Now I'm down 1-0 against a closey. Not just, a great place to be. Yeah, exactly. Um. So something I've seemed to get from your channel is that you spend a good amount of time analyzing other fencers, uh, competitors coming up with plans against them. Are you the kind of person that will look at other fencers and try and like take actions, take copy styles? Have you been influenced by other fencers? Yeah, when I first started, I would absolutely... Uh, well, YouTube wasn't that big, actually, so it was like fencing TV and whatnot, fencing pictures. Like There's people trying to make like little channels, but... There's so little money involved, I'm pretty sure they all just went out of business eventually because they're probably not making much, anything. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess before there was, uh, before they were supported by a Russian oligarch, uh, I'm pretty sure the FIE had even less money than they had now. Uh, so yeah. I would like order DVDs from French competitions. Uh, wow. I went like way out of my way. Like, I, like for all I knew, like some guy was probably sending like this. I could have been, I had no idea. I was sending this guy 20 euros and I was hoping to God it was a DVD in an envelope a month or two later. But you got him. And uh, who were like your favorite people to watch? Who would you try and steal Genet. from? I, I always tried to steal from Genet. Yeah. Uh, th that was just a mad, like just the way he fenced. But there are things I could do and there's, there, you have to accept that there are things that the guy's six six. like I can't do what he does. So then there's guys like Jung I tried to steal from. Um, but then, like, uh, at that point, like, so... Well, we have to rewind. I, I So after I fenced for three, four, five... I was around 2022. I had moved to Quebec from Toronto because back then uh, Tommy Linto was fencing there. Uh, Charles saint -Sida. Anyway, like, the top four guys, Vince Peltier, who is accused of being my brother, but I'm far too handsome for to be in that family. Um, they did like the best in Canada were there. So I was like, I need to go there. So like I was, and like, this was crazy. I, I was so into it because I would work night shifts at Tim Hortons from 11 wow. to seven. I would go to bed at eight. I would get up at five. I'd go to practice at six until 10. And then I would get up, I would leave practice, shower, go to work, do my overnight baking and then rinse, wash, repeat. Uh, that is uh, very dedicated. I was very tired. <laughs> About one year in, I told my boss, I was like, you need to take me off night shifts because I'm going to pass out. Uh, yes. And it was Good really on you hard. You recognize that. 
it was really hard though because like on the weekends like all of a sudden i had to just reset my uh, my mental clock for a competition and i, I was just uh, oh wow i already have a hard time with uh mental issues on the strip like that was just like polar opposites day in and out but it was anyway i, I was a young kid and I, I didn't know that i could ask for a better job or just go look for one uh sometimes you feel trapped which is unfortunate yeah learning that you can just go find another job is a is a pretty good realization the before yeah. and after are very different I might be a little bit privileged to say that, but yeah. <laughs> but actually, that being said, I only technically have a high school diploma. But anyway. Wow. Uh, okay. And then so... what else? Uh, yeah, then Quebec happened. Then uh, I needed to go back home to take care of my dad. Uh, so I went back to Toronto, uh, where I trained in Toronto Fencing Club again. And at that point, uh, I was still like, I, I stopped committing into fencing as hard because long story, I base, I was, it's expensive yeah uh, so i got a culinary degree and whatnot so i was working as a dishwasher slash line cook at this uh private club so i was actually training to be a chef at the time uh and then i did a world cup in montreal and i beat uh i made top 64 and i beat fiedler who was a uh, rank one yeah at the time. he was a big name at the time and that, that's where like i remember the night before um I was hanging with my friends, and he was like, how do you feel about Fiedler? So I don't know. I was like, I'm just going to go watch videos, and let's see what happened. And then, like, next thing I know, it's 4 in the morning, and I've just got this, like, chart. I had him, like, broken down. I was like, what does he do when he's ahead? What does he do when he's behind? What does he do when nothing's happening? What does he do? Like, I had it, like, to a science, because uh, I had a lot of uh, data to go through. Like, uh, yeah. I was fencing Robbery. I saw him fence Janet. I, I saw he had quite a few bouts out there. Uh, and then, like, I came down to if I put my hand high, he will never hit him under my hand because he liked to flick six. And if I do nothing, he will eventually just flesh. And at one point, I was comfortable with disengaging a six. So as soon as I got one point, I just sat there, put my hand high, and waited for him to go. And he, he actually did. It was crazy. And then I was like, wow, I'm pretty good at reading this. And then I made 32s. And then back, then I actually lost to a Japanese, which was really funny. Because uh, back then they were they were still good, but not as good. Like compared to beating Fiedler, like just losing to the, uh, uh, Sakamoto was not on the same level. So that was like yeah. my best result. Yeah, that a World Cup was a top thirty-two. And then That's I moved awesome. to China. Oh wow! Okay, the story took a turn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I got a phone call from a Chinese businessman. And they're like, hi, Sam, we, we saw you got some good results. So uh, do you want to come to China? And I was like, step one, I was like, is this a scam? <laughs> Very good question to ask. And then uh, they, they assured me it wasn't, uh, I guess I was with any scammer. But then, anyway, they sent someone to actually talk to me. So this was Van Gogh in uh, China. Yeah, Van Gogh. Uh, back when they were only a club in uh, Beijing. So they flew me out for two months. That was the longest visa I could get. And to show me it was legit, they paid for everything. Uh, and then I met the probably the richest man I'll ever meet because uh, we get there and he's like, oh, don't worry, I'll put you up in this hotel. I was like, oh, that's a nice company face for it. And he's like, no, it's my hotel. I was like, OK, <laughs> not bad. And he's like, oh, yeah, my club's still pretty small. Like we only have 10,000 members. So I'm like, yeah, OK, bud. <laughs> so I'm like, I, I didn't understand the scope of what was about to happen. And then I walk into this like. Four story building with like every floor just having like three four full-size gyms that are just full of fencers like they had wow. like a like clad like they, they had like class blocks uh it was just amazing uh and then this guy turned fencing into just this factory of for both fencing but also pretty much printing money uh and it was aimed wow. at like the upper middle class and more like the people who could got there so it's a bit of prestige behind it and then i after the two months, he was like, all right, we'll send you home. Do you want a job? And I was like, yep. Uh, so you came back as a coach? Yeah, but I was like, actually, I want to keep fencing. And they said, fine, if you want to fence in China, we'll pay for everything. And then uh, originally, like, they promised, oh, we'll pay for all your World Cups and stuff. So I got, like, I was very, a little naive. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, I was like, even if they don't, honestly, like, it's still a worthy experience. So I did that for two and a half years. I'm actually Chinese national champion. Uh, wow, so, that is... So Nanjing nice... 2011, um, <laughs> that I won a Chinese national tournament. And then 
I technically took someone's spot on the team. So after that, they made a, a rule that uh, foreigners couldn't compete in those national ones anymore. So a bucket list, a uh, little checkbox. It's always nice when there's a rule uh, made after you and your performance. I was like, yes. Uh, th those tournaments were crazy. Like, honest, they're bigger than Nax. Uh, wow. 500, 500 people. Uh, I, and actually, like, it was the shittiest pool. I think I went two and four in pools. Uh, and then I, I barely made the cut. Uh, two and four or three and three, but either way, like, not a great pool. Uh, but I didn't really, like, I didn't... Um, I was a purely mechanical fencer. Like, I still have, like, the muscle memory. All we would do is, like, just hit hand. Like, with my coach, we just hit the hand for, like, half an hour. Then do, mm -hmm. like, 20 minutes of pure lunging. And then, like, after that, you were just, a, like, a technical machine. But as a... St strategically, uh, other than what I already knew, I feel like I didn't gain that much. Uh, but, like, all these uh, the Chinese guys are just so good at actions. They're just still... Uh, it, it's you can't out fence them. You have to outsmart them. Yeah, it sounds like they've really built a factory for just like an assembly line for high quality technical fencers. And then, uh, well, I feel like it's where Korea did it a little bit better, uh, and even mm -hmm. Japan where they they put a more of thought behind it. Uh, but uh, because with that, unless you have a prodigy, I feel like someone can't just know how to do every action and get good. Uh, there needs to be a bit of brain behind it. So otherwise, you yeah. plateau really hard at one point. But I mean, there's Chinese fencers are still good. Like, no, not to bash Absolutely. them too hard. <laughs> but like when no, Obi went to China, like you saw them like start climbing really fast, because uh, uh, he took them from like a relatively speaking pretty low tier, and then all of a sudden they're uh, borderline putting pulling medals at uh, every other World Cup. So it's very very impressive. Uh, yeah, and then uh. And then after that, like in China, I was like a legend. Like I walked to the club, I had like a standing ovation, like people clapping. I had like parents like borderline asking me to kiss their baby. Like I had like random people just shaking my hand. Uh, people just like take. I was like, oh my god, okay. That is uh, wild. And then I went from like being booked for lessons because I was a foreigner to being booked because people thought I was good. Uh, it, it it just it, I. It went crazy. Like I would get a, I would leave the the house at eight, and I would get home at like ten. Just lessons all day, man. Lessons all day, or uh, a lot of times I would fit in uh, two hours of training. Uh, mm. Some days I would book off because I would go to the Chinese training center in Beijing. So like just yeah. So all, all, overall, it was great. Uh, and at one point, they put me in the Guangdong Guangdong Sports Schools. That's South China. Uh, right above Hong Kong, so I, I got to chill in a sports school. They just, I like, I basically, I would just show up for all their practice, then go back to my dorm, but I didn't have any classes, so I would just chill. It was really nice. Uh, and then, yeah, like, so that was cool, though. So we woke up at 5.30 a.m. Uh, we had to be at the track by 5.45, otherwise we were in trouble. Thankfully, I never found out what it was, but I'm pretty sure it was just more running. Um, Good guess. Then we would run till six forty-five. Uh, then seven o'clock was uh, dinner, breakfast, and then ten o'clock we had another practice. Twelve o'clock lunch. Then they had class for a while, so we didn't start again till five. Then five till seven we would train again. So for that time in my life, I was definitely as close to being a professional athlete as I could. How did you like that? Just the I entire day being strict about fencing. I Great. loved it, but it's because I was getting paid for it too. Like Van Gogh just paid me to be there, and they were like, "Just come back on the weekends to the club," because it was crazy busy on the weekends. So they, but like they're they're nuts. Like they had like a marketing team of like fifty people that would just call people to come do fencing trials. Like uh, and, I guess it works, and especially like I guess China has the volume to do that. And if you do that, then I feel if you do that in America, you're just people won't even pick up the phone to be honest. Yeah, I was gonna say I, I feel like you're not gonna get to talk to very many people. Hey, you want to come from fencing? No. Like, I, I don't think you'll get to that. Uh, yeah, if yeah. they pick up the phone, that's a huge win at the start. Uh, yeah, and then, like, I, I would just walk around and be like, hey, that guy's Chinese champion. I'd be like, that guy? And then I'd go say hi, and then it was just a done deal. The parents were just, they loved it. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Chinese national champion. So from uh, being a professional fencer in China, made your way back to Canada. And then... Uh, yeah, then I that, this is where it gets a little weird. I got a little depressed because I didn't know what I was doing with my life. So I, 
kind of le I left China and I didn't know if I wanted to go back because I still kind of wanted to fence. And then like the depression hits uh, different for everyone, but I just kind of yeah. shut down and didn't really do anything for like a year. Uh, I just, I went back to the restaurant and I was just working, but ultimately I was honestly just not in my best mental state. Uh, I just kept fencing, did my thing. And then, uh, what did I do then? Oh, then I went back to school. I did one year of, uh, about one year of marketing. Uh, I was going to go, so I'll just get a marketing degree or something, business marketing, because it's generic enough to, to just get me into any, any, any kind of nine to five job. And mm -hmm. then, um, uh, I was still pretty dead broke. I used my China money to pay back everything I owed for all the previous years. Uh, which could have been much worse. Uh, thankfully, my family was backing me up heavily back then. Uh, not that they're not now, if you're watching. Um, <laughs> and yeah, uh, then I, I I just stopped for a while. And then after that, while I was at, uh, at school, I ended up, uh, I, I didn't quite have enough money. So I found a job at the bank in Toronto. I took a job there. Then I leveraged my experience to move through the ranks. And here I am. But I, I dead stopped for like two, three years. And I got fat. Like, what am I now? I'm like around 180, 185 pounds, which is uh, still on a heavier side uh, for some. But like, I was like 240. Like, I had a gut. Oh, wow, um, man. That is a huge body transformation from being a pro athlete. Oh, yeah. It was bad. I was and just, I, I didn't change how I ate anyway. But uh, at least I had That's... a job, I guess. Uh, but like, it's also the office job. Like, you're just at an office job. You don't move at all. You it's just rough. Sit there, you don't do anything. And then, uh, at first, I started going back to the gym, and I was like, "There is no progression. I, I don't like the like. I, if I were if I if I were to do gym, I'd have to go into bodybuilding or like just do it for a reason." Yeah, it's it's like you can make yourself do it when you're like, "This will help me with fencing, the thing I care about." But just doing it to do it is rough. Right. Yeah, agreed. And then um, what else happened? Yeah, and then uh, University of Toronto contacted me, and they're like, "Hey, Sam." uh we're looking for a coach this year do you want to do it and i was like i don't know i guess like trying to be too cool for school i was like no i'm done with that life <laughs> uh oh actually wait no so i'm getting my timeline mixed up sorry so after that uh van gogh opened in toronto so i did okay. that in toronto for about a year but it drove me insane to watch other people fence at the same time I had to just leave. I, I was uh, like, I had to take sick days constantly because I would just, I, I couldn't focus on anything. Like it just, like just to describe it weirdly, I was like, dad, like, what's it like to feel scared all the time and not know what it is? And he was like, son, that's anxiety. <laughs> uh, Good conversation so, to have. Yeah. So I, I had to be very self-aware there because I almost lost a bunch of friends or I could have, I almost cut a lot, cut a lot of ties. And then I was like, okay. I'm done with coaching for now. I'm going to go work at the bank. That's when I said it. So I was still broke, but I took a year to work at Van Gogh. And I was like, mm -hmm. now I'm going to go uh, coaching, see if I want to do it. But I was like, I have, I want to fence. Uh, so basically I went back, worked my way, but I was like, I can't afford it. So I started working my way to a point where I could afford to fence, or at least a little bit. Uh, and then at one point I, uh, I just started again. The UFT contacted me and I was like, oh, this is a good end. Like I'll go to university club. It'll be super chill. Uh, and then like they gave me access to all their facilities too. And the uh, university facilities are great. So I started working out again. I lost 40 pounds in like three months. Nice. Like, I just melted. Granted, I was eating like uh, 1500 calories a day for a while, but uh, I was very hungry. Uh, and yeah. Then, yeah, I started again and the I was not very good. Uh, I could see what I wanted to do and my body couldn't do it. Everything hurt. Uh, and so I did one competition and I lost to a guy. I was so mad. I, all the kids I was coaching like the year before, they're like, wow, coach Sam's really mad. <laughs> uh, no, and I felt so guilty about that. So, I, uh, but anyway, I lost to a guy and I turned around and I was like, guys, I don't want to lose to that guy again. And it's not going to happen. And then just the, after the fact, rethinking about it. You know, when you lose, like, I don't know if you get that, but my, my immediate thought is I want to try again. Yes. A hundred percent. It's like, I want to go ask this person for a rematch in the middle of the tournament. I was like, rematch me, bitch. Like, I'll kill you. <laughs> I dare you. Uh, so, 
uh yeah so i missed that feeling i was like oh my god i missed losing that's weird to say yeah no that's a that's a really good way to put it uh, so i was all right so then i just kept working and then i overtrained i got back into it too fast and i pulled my leg Ooh. uh so that was awkward so i trained enough to qualify for a nationals i cleaned my pool and my last match i hurt my leg and i was like this is Oh more no. than hurting. So I get into my first match and I couldn't lunge. I couldn't step and I lost. Uh, and I was, I was so mad. I kicked my mask into the wall, which I am glad I didn't get black carded for, which I should have, but, um, such is life, Yeah. but yeah, uh, 10 out of 10, don't recommend kicking your mask. It really hurts your foot. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about that part, but yeah, that does, uh, That sounds rough. And leg injuries are really tough on fringe group fencers. Oh man, there was the one point I was like, man, did I just start again, just get injured and like reconsider quitting? Like it, it was, it was a lot of up and downs there. So but then I was, it took about two months, uh, and then I was able to fence with only steps after about one month. So Mm -hmm. it, it was, it was good. And then uh, I, I met Michel Sicard at a training camp, uh, and then he gave me a nice, easy lesson. Well, easy, relatively speaking, nice, easy lesson. Gave me a lot of confidence. Because, uh, like, a lot of things, like, he would do things, and he was like, how are you hitting me? And he's like, that, that's, like, for the, the level you claim to be, you're not at the level you claim to be. So I was like, oh, nice, you think I'm good. That's nice to hear from Sakard. So, so I was like, holy cow, okay. So I kept uh, fenced a bit. I was doing my things in Toronto, doing what I can. At that point, I was, I had an okay job, so I could, and I was, I mean, like, I was living at home, so I was not paying rent. So I was able to be a little bit more carefree with my money. I started fencing again. Then I did a satellite. Uh, no, I did a Canadian tournament. Got second place. I won the national one. So I was like, oh, okay. And I beat like so, like I beat some pretty good people. Like I beat Dylan French. I was like, oh, at least I can beat the guys who are at the top right now. Okay, um, let's keep going. So I went to the Yeah. satellite. Got third place. This time Dylan beat me. So I was like, okay, so I'm meeting the criteria that the other guys need to go to World Cups. Let's go do a World Cup. Uh, what did I do? I started easy. I did the Vancouver one because it was local. Uh, didn't make it out of pools. And I was like, that's fine. Let's just keep going for about a year and uh, just wait. And then uh, I did Heidenheim. No, I did Burn. Didn't make it out of pools again. Then I was like, all right, am I delusional? Like, do I think I'm good or that? But at that point, I kind of knew, like, I needed beta. Like, in my mind, I was like, I think if I stay in Toronto, I'm not going to get better. Uh, or I'm going to improve dramatically slowly unless I'm some kind of prodigy. So, uh, and, like, as much as I want to be that guy, I'm not the guy who's, like, going to go do, like, 15, like 15,000 sprints to get faster just by myself. Like, I, I need to put myself in an environment where things are going to happen. Yes. Uh, that like it's I I can't just go to a track by myself and envision things and he's gonna beat you like I don't it's I I'm not the montage guy. I don't know how realistic that is in the sport, anyway. Yeah, true. but uh, um, no, I'm certainly not that person either. So that was uh, then I kept yeah after that that's that's where Igor he asked me roughly around that time frame Igor was like well you can come to Vancouver, and Igor being the owner of Dynamo. Um, and in my mind, I was like, all right, I can do this. Uh, and then, as mentioned before, everything lined up to where I could move to Vancouver. And I knew I was a little bit out of my depth as soon as I got there. Like, all the kids he's training are in great shape, the technically very proficient. Uh, strategically, at the time, I thought they were very good. Now, now that I've worked with Eric for a while, I think they have a lot to work on. <laughs> That uh, perspective change after training a while is really useful. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then also uh, on my pseudo comeback, uh, Eric came, came down to coach at uh, one of the tournaments and I talked with him. So I was like, uh, I already knew I got I would get along with him before even moving to Vancouver. So like it wasn't just a blind moving for a coach. I was like, I, I can learn from this guy. Good. Yeah, Eric's a great coach. Oh, yeah. And just the experience. And then like the way he explains things, he's like, you just hit people uh, you just Makes gotta sound you just easy. put yourself in the position to hit people and it'll work uh and it's just by like repeating just like for training for high level is boring to some extent uh, you can't do too many flashy things unless it's your move right mm-hmm. like heinzer's back flick that's something he's i'm sure he actively practices 
Oh yeah, uh, right. Like uh, you, so you can't put yourself uh, unless you want to do that. You, you can't. You just got to keep practicing, right? So now it's just I get to the gym and it's just someone from once defense to fifteen. In my mind, it's the first five points. If I'm leading after five points, then my goal is to lock that match down and take it to fifteen. If I'm losing, then obviously I have a match on my hands that I need to catch up on. So like it's just about recreating scenarios that way when they happen at competition, you've already seen this, and you can do it. Uh, and it's things right or like you just do like you push you release see if they follow push release they don't follow ah crap okay right just things that can be replicated constantly without revealing too much yeah the breaking things into situations like that and getting comfortable with those situations helps you get comfortable with people you haven't had a chance to watch their videos or come up with a plan for yeah exactly and that's something uh delum said in one of the videos he said he's very big uh because he wasn't training with the French national team anymore, but he still had a lot of experience. So he, he did a lot of visualization. On He would just sit there and like do his footwork, and then at least he could picture these kinds of scenarios. And originally when he said it, it didn't make sense to me, because I was like, how are you picturing so many things? But he's actually not picturing that many things. He's picturing his actions in different timings. So it's not actually as hard as I imagined it to be. Wasn't surprised. But it takes like a bit of self-awareness i guess it, but everyone learns it differently it's very hard is that something that you've kept up with the visualization practice a lot uh just kind of i i like you I, I try to picture moments now when i'm fencing like i'm gonna go when this moment happens not when something very specific happens and when mm -hmm. you you can picture a moment a lot better than you can something very specific so when you're by yourself, you can at least just practice. And then when you get into the bout, you're like, well, I've seen this before, I think. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, that kind of gets me into my next question. What um, What's your training schedule like? Like, obviously, you bout and take lessons and practice footwork, but uh, kind of how much time a week do you spend on it? What do you do that you think is different from uh, your peers? Uh, let's see. So Monday and Wednesdays are heavy bouting. So I'll get to the club at six and I probably won't leave till nine, nine thirty. Wow. So it's pure bouting. Uh, and then like, it's, it's hard. Like I, I need to be, I need to be dead by the time I get home. Like I, I get days where I, I get home and I just start cramping. Mm, yeah. Uh, it just, it, it's, 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 well, it's really funny cause I'll sit down to eat and I'm like, ah, ab cramp, ab cramp. Then I get absolutely mocked. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Monday, Wednesday, and Sundays are heavy bouting days. So it's usually a solid three hours at least. Uh, and then I'll throw in two private lessons that will be uh, either sprinkled before or after bouting or uh, before or after workout, depending what we're working on. Like right now, we need to get my endurance up, so they will usually be, unfortunately, after bouting. Ooh, that is tough. And they suck. Or after the workout, either or. So... Uh, and then, yeah, two times a week, it's uh, a, two workouts. So they'll usually be like, oh, actually, I have my workout book. Nice. Uh, that I, so let's see what the last one was. Uh, they're written, so it'll be like, so we did, uh, we found out what like my max bench was, max squat was. And then uh, this one was six rounds of uh Oh, this is a long one. Oh, this is a little old, but like six rounds of uh, six times 90%. Uh, bench, six round, uh, time, uh, eight times 90%. And then you do that in squats. It was eight times squats of 90%. Then I do these, uh, the pull downs for your back. Mm -hmm. uh, you do some calves and then you do some wall sits. And then we do a uh, plyo box jumps. So six rounds of that, it's... A little bit grueling they're, they're long workouts and the way eric phrases them out to me is your bouts are long like so it helps you keep your focus some days he'll take away my ear pods so i have to do the, the, the i have to do the workout just absolutely nothing to focus on like it's just you have what's in front of you and it sucks yeah that sounds terrible uh, um, but you get your workouts from your from your fencing coach that's interesting yeah well, he's got a background in uh in physical education so I, I can try i can trust it uh, otherwise mm -hmm. i would highly recommend anyone get a an actual uh a fitness instructor or trainer just 
And like, don't be afraid to show them what fencing is like, because a lot of them will be like, oh, I'll just, they'll, they'll just mimic, like, at the, if you're lucky, they'll mimic a badminton training or something. Uh, if not, That's a really just, good way to uh, put it. Yeah, you just gotta, if you're lucky, they'll, you'll get a guy who'll do a bit of research and then he'll find out it's like badminton, but if you're unlucky, at best, they'll get you to do like box jumps or whatever, and that's it. Uh... No, I've taken I've taken my FA into a lot of places and been like, this is what I use. This is this is a flick. I need Yeah. to be able to do this without my arm breaking. Can you help? Yeah, exactly. Things like that. Uh, or, or if you really want, like, go do something, uh, go find any random uh, hit workouts. Those are really good Mm. for fencing. If you don't want to spend money on a personal trainer, just look, do some hit workouts that you find online. That's uh, better than nothing. And those can be done at home most of the time. Uh, How much and... of your training is uh, not physical? Like, do you spend uh, much time watching yourself on video uh, from practice or from competitions? Uh, constant. I'm always watching fencing, but that's just what I do. Mm hmm Uh, that's on my own time. I mean, uh, God, I hope my boss doesn't watch this, but uh, I work from home, so uh, I spend a lot of time on the side monitor just watching fencing or even making my videos sometimes uh depends Nice. on how busy it is uh so the but i don't like it's not like mandated i just do it because i like it Mm -hmm. uh but for me it's uh if I, there's something new i learn i go find it in videos and then i usually make a video about it That's a it's a great way to kind of motivate yourself to keep learning and then uh leave a log like we talked about earlier that you can look back and be like, oh, this is what was important to me two years ago. Okay, and this is where I'm at now. Yeah, exactly. And then you realize that it makes a bit of a cocktail uh, of of experience. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about your, your mental model of fencing. Like when you are coming up with a plan for a bout, what are the variables that you look at? Uh, what things do you try and adjust? Um, how do you come up with your framework? So, like, at what level? Um, not the most specific things, like Okay. the Fiedler thing was super cool, where you knew he would never go under your hand, but that's probably not something you're thinking about in every bout with, like, a new fencer. No, yeah, But, um... usually like a new fencer, I look at is there is their footwork better than mine? And Okay. relatively often, relatively often, the answer is no. Like, I don't think I have great footwork, but I think it's it's better than most. Uh, and then I just like, how strong is this guy? Like physically, can I bully my way through him? Uh, and that'll, and that's another one. And then it, it's been t like, it, it's a little bit tough because even nowadays, like I could say that most fencers that I fence are physically stronger than me. <laughs> Okay. or at least it feels Um. that way. Uh, but I just find uh, a lot of them are just not very bright. <laughs> That's so interesting. What is a? Uh, give me an example. Like, okay, this person, uh, their footwork is better than mine. They're stronger than me, but I'm having a really easy time with them because. Like, actually, I could, uh, here, I, I'll pull up, I'll do screen share. So you can see my screen. So we'll go to YouTube. So you can see what I see, right? All right. So. Yeah, this guy. So. This guy, look, uh, he won like five and one in pools. He, he's not bad. He, Yeah, he no, looks I... like pretty strong. And apparently he's giving like all the juniors a really hard time. Then I just saw a guy with a French grip. So I was like, okay, I need to find out if he can parry. Yes. Uh, that was one of my first ones. But then like right off the bat, this guy just pushes me. Like he just full on disrespects me. I was like, just not impressed. Uh, and then I like, I see here, like first I was like, okay, it's for work. Not that great. Like Mm he's -hmm. looking a little lanky. But then already there, you're like, all right, you can expect that it's going to be a little weird. Right, Yep, but like, he looks like he's pushing. He's not worried about you. like he's pushing. He showed me. See here, he. Sh I saw this six. I knew it would come out. Yep. But then here, I'm just keeping my point in line because I know he's doing that. 
And then he just attacks me out of nowhere. This was just me being ready. I didn't plan this. It just happened. He just attacks me out of nowhere. Like, I, I, get, the, I get it here, which makes me look like a badass. But then I would have got him here as well. And probably here for a double. So my worst case scenario here was a double. So I was like, alright, this guy likes to attack for no reason. Or at least he thinks he can attack me for no reason. So I was like, alright, let's put it like the next one. We'll, we'll, let's see if I can parry him. I can. And this is actually yeah. like deadly close though. Alright, see my framework was just put tip on. I miss. Oh god. A little pull like... Parry. Just pull out the parry. All, all from uh, keeping your footwork at a pretty good quality. Like when he accelerates, you're not losing your balance. You're opening the space. Yeah, exactly. And then I was like, all right, I'll just attack him. Let's see what happens. So I just, boom. I miss, but I get the recovery. Like this guy's just so wide, not respecting what I can do. See, I almost get it here. He's smart enough to back up, but it's so big that I kept my tip. And he tried yeah. to backflick you, of he course. He tried to backflick me, like, what are you doing, bud? <laughs> and, uh, you can't really see here, but then here I knew he was going to push, so I'll just put my tip on and wait. Like, no, nothing, right? It wasn't, I don't feel like I was fencing super fancily. You can't, you can't really see it here, but then here I was like, all right, then I'll just push. Like, you can kind of see my tip here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I can I'll tell just, you guys are still pretty close. Like, we're getting, he's getting kind of close, uh, but he's just pushing, and then I think I, I just kind of go in. Right, you can even see the moment where I was like, I think, like, my tip is here. And yeah. I'm like, okay, you don't want to react? Good for you. <laughs> and then this guy's just giving me all the body language of, I should be beating this guy. Yeah, you can tell that this guy is upset. He thought he was going to have a lot easier time. Yeah, this guy is Canadian. And, they, well, I'm pretty sure this guy, like, kicked my ass in pools, like, hard. Um, So he might have told him, like, yo, I kicked this guy's ass. And then here when I'm I ask like, for... my framework work. I have I'm leading five one. Now it's about keeping the lead. So what do you feel like you shift at that point? Nothing. Like this guy does not quite understand what I'm doing yet. Let's. What happens here? See, he just runs into it again. So I, like, don't change until uh, you have to really. Yeah, agreed. Is there uh I I know you mentioned that okay after the first two you wanted to attack him and see if he could uh, stop you. On each touch, are you constantly like looking for your chance to attack, or is it just more uh, focused on defense? Uh, against him, like you can see, I'm constantly prodding. I don't want him to get close for free, mm -hmm. right? So I'm just prodding. So all I'm all I'm doing is right. I'm occasionally waving my blade, but there's zero intention behind this. I just want gotcha. him to think I might parry. Just kind of keeping him occupied, taking a shot where you see it. Yeah, like a nine three. Like I don't need to take uh, overly crazy risks. Let's see. Like he thinks I'm gonna kind like a lot of it is just showing one thing, doing the other. And then mm -hmm. I just parry him, right? So the, for the, I'm just showing tip, tip, tip. I'm a little off balance, point, and then eventually, boom, get out of here. <laughs> Some very nice French grip parries. And then, uh, yeah, like, and then you take some risk, and then you can kind of see the same framework, like even next bout. And like, honestly, if if one of the people watching me is watching this. And you think you can beat me off this info? Please do. Yeah, it's not like you're uh, giving out your secrets. It's just, this is where your head's at. Yeah, even this guy, right? Super tall French gripper. Uh, he did, if I remember, he disrespected, like, same thing. I just stay far. I didn't do too much. I kind of, I felt his foot was doable, but, you know, I go in, I can't be punished, but then I just hit the hand. I wasn't trying to hit the hand well i was but i just kind of put myself in the situation too and then this guy's very static so i'm just every time he wants to push right the, this beat is not meaningless because if he attacks me he's gonna lose his weapon but it's mostly just to distract him and again right i just have my point in line just distracting he attacks i hit the hand 
you give him a lot of chances to make mistakes. Yeah, like he, it's kind of like I'm giving I'm giving a lot of uh, false info as to where he might think I'll do something, mm -hmm. but I'm actually just waiting for that. It's a war of attrition, really. So yeah, this one here, right? I was like, let's see if I actually can parry him, right? So mm -hmm. I I I, uh, I get the parry. And he is, he, I like, for a guy that size, I realize he doesn't actually lunge very far. So he's always constantly balanced. So when you actually fall into the trap of thinking you can parry that, you're just getting remis constantly. So yeah, because like, he's not stretched out in his lunge. Yeah, exactly. So then I was like, all right, back to what works. Nice. Right, so it's, it's okay to try stuff, but... Yeah, it's interesting, like, um, something, a mistake I would make would be, ah, my parry wasn't good enough, or I, did, I wasn't able to repose fast enough, not paying attention to the fact that he's not really lunging, he's barely attacking, and I shouldn't be parrying. Yeah, exactly, he wasn't lunging, well, he, he, like, they're very short lunges for how tall he is. Then we get hung up on how tall they are, mm -hmm. and pretty much, like, uh, I can't really hear it, but I, I was being pretty much just told, like, you do not care how tall this guy is. <laughs> and you had uh, Eric's dad there coaching you. Oh yeah, this guy's an absolute legend. This guy's so funny. Yeah, I have I have not had the pleasure of meeting. Uh, it's Philippe, right? Philip, yeah. Philip. Uh, and then uh, yeah, he's see here. Oh, here I get baited hard. Good for him. Right, he's giving me that uh, that fake tempo, that fake step that I kept wanting. He's pretending to be stretched out when really he's still good he's, to go. Yeah. So I think we just go back to making the timing mine. But a lot of it, like, I'm, this is something I found out here for myself is, so now I'm getting lazy here, uh, but I found out that I need, oh, this is something I do a lot, so you'll see me constantly try the beat and then go for the foot. Ooh, I like it. But uh, is like that uh, before I fence, I need to be tired. And I mean, like, in my warm up, like I need to be panting a bit, because I in my for me like the match doesn't start until I'm moving and like I'm into it and blood, sweat, and tears kind of thing. So mm -hmm. before every match, I would like yo Dylan fence me and I'll just move like a madman. Even like between DEs. Yeah, but like at World Cups, you have a lot of time between DEs. Uh, Makes sense. Like an hour, right? So twenty years before, I would just start moving like crazy. Uh, actually, even before Soclosi. Because uh, I realize that uh, I fence really poorly when my legs aren't moving. And if my legs need time to warm up, it's I'm already it's too late. Uh, so I can I get in the bout and I already feel like my legs have done some work. And it doesn't cost me that much. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So that, that, that's what, that was my biggest takeaway there. So let's screen off. And then we're back. Well, that was really insightful for uh, where you put your attention during the bout and like what kinds of things you are seeing that your opponents are not. But yeah, like for me, it's just, is my forward good enough? And to be honest, to any beginner, if you can tell yourself my forward isn't good enough, go do more footwork. So when you, uh, if, you're, if you're starting a bout or watching somebody and you decide, oh, my footwork is better than theirs, what do you do differently? Usually it means I'll be able to control when I can attack. Because uh, you like someone bad footwork is going to be janky. So first one is I see, are they following? If they're following, I'll pull purposely, push back, pull purposely, push back. Now one point you pull and then you just go in. And you can just see that coming. Um, a lot of people bad footwork, they'll typically just go to the back of the strip. Uh, and then at that point, they'll just lock themselves there. So they'll be standing there, so you just go back, they don't want to follow, fine, I'll go back in, go back, fine, I'll go back in. They have no idea what's your real one. I'll do this all day. At one point, yeah. if they decide to leave that, oh, you're dead. Uh, the scary one is when people, like, so close, he was just like, you're not stepping forward ever, and I was like, oh, shit. Uh, when he decided he wanted to hit, it was very hard to stop him in his track. Yeah, as a French group fencer, like, the person who is willing to close in on you and can take three parries is very scary and difficult to deal with. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, like Lamardo said, like the most like thanks Olympic champion. He was like, "Why you should have attacked into him?" And I was like, "Do you think I was not trying?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's uh, I like, pretty I see scary. Your point, but I was freaking out, dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, okay, last question, and you can take this as seriously or as much as fun as you like. Uh, what is the piece of gear? that is the most important to you? Like, if you don't have it at a tournament or for your practice, you're going to have a bad time. That's hard. A piece of gear. Uh, honestly, I always wear the same socks. Uh, okay. like Eric makes me wear... Well, at first, I used to, like, go to practice, and I wouldn't wear my fencing socks. And then after Eric's that, very Eric was... serious about this. Yeah, yeah, he was like, why aren't you wearing the same socks every time? That's a variable you don't need to, like, you don't need to have that, that exists. That doesn't need to be a variable. So I always wear the same. I have, like, 10 pairs of Under Armour socks that I double sock with cotton, that I double over with cotton socks, and that's all I wear. Nice, uh, yeah. So just you. And then he was like, well, the French, like, these guys have everything at their disposal, so you can't give them any free variables. So I just wear, yeah, socks. Uh, honestly, like, if, for, for someone who's a beginner, like, get yourself a good glove. Um, a lot of people focus on the shoes, but I feel like as a beginner, you don't know what a good shoe feels like. So as long as you're not wearing flip-flops, don't worry about shoes. Get yourself a good glove. Good glove. Okay, interesting. And I, I like the consistency of having your fencing socks on all the time. Yeah, just uh, and, like I just I, I don't understand people who will go to practice in shorts or even sweatpants, and then like those are the people who go to competition like oh I haven't worn my fencing pants in so long and, like that's a really stupid thing to brag about. <laughs> All right, well uh, thank you so much for your time, Sam. It was really good getting to uh, sit down with the national champion of China and uh, <laughs> learn a lot about fencing. Yeah, anytime, man. 